Hello and welcome to the Webroot and Storagecraft Ransomware Resistance Webinar, which is kindly sponsored by Kaseya. Thank you for attending today. I am Carl Thompson from Storagecraft, and the agenda for today will kick off with a quick five-minute overview from Craig Allen, who is a technical director at Kaseya, to discuss their automation capabilities and unified IT management platform. Welcome, Craig. Thanks very much. And then Good Craig morning. will be followed by Tyler. Thanks, Craig. And uh, yeah, so Craig will then be followed by Tyler Moffat, who is a senior threat research analyst at Webroot. Tyler is going to spend 20 minutes on thought leadership and diving into attack vectors and top ransomware payloads, finishing up on how we can predict ourselves. So, Tyler, I understand you're dialing in from Colorado. Thanks for joining us today. Not a problem. I'm happy to be here, and I uh, can't wait to you know let you guys know what's going on. Awesome. And then um, finally, Storagecraft, as your last line of defense, for up to 20 minutes, I will talk about why business continuity planning is so critical and take a quick look at your recovery options and best practice. We'll wrap up at the end with Q&A, so please feel free to send through any questions as we go, and I'll moder moderate this at the end between, um, between each of us. So uh, up first, we have uh, Craig from Kaseya. Cool. Thank you very much. Um, so what I wanted to do today is specifically, I mean obviously we're, we're aware that we need um, strong security inside our computing environments to make sure that we've got the smallest threat footprint that we can have and, and Storagecraft and Webroot will obviously be able to talk at length about this but not only with your antivirus products and your backup products, you also need you know additional visibility and potentially security inside your environment. So if we could just bounce to the next slide please. Uh, Kaseya is a portfolio. I don't know if my screen's actually still there. Yeah, perfect. Um, Kaseya is a, is a portfolio that we actually call IT Complete. So we're, we're most well known for the BSA, which is our virtual system administrator. It's our agent-based technology. Uh, it also has integrations with uh, uh, Storagecraft and Webroot. So you know it has that nice single pane of glass. It does monitoring. It has automation capabilities. It does patch management, both Windows and third party. So it really is the core of, of helping you secure your environment from your server and desktop environments. We've also got uh, Traverse, which is our network management solution. So that's very much about understanding your data center infrastructure or your hypervisors, your guests, your network links, as well as a little bit around your application management and your end user experience. Um, the, to, moving on from the, that end user experience is obviously securing your end user access. And this is where Kaseya's AuthAmble product comes in. This is our two-factor authentication, as well as single sign-on product. And on top of that, we have uh, our backup and disaster recovery products. So we've got um, uh, many integrations. First and foremost is the one with Storagecraft, which they'll be talking about their solution at length. Um, we've also got, as everybody's moving to the cloud, we've added two new products to our portfolio. The first of those is the Office 365 management through our 365 command. And what this allows you to do is get much better visibility and security inside your you and your customers' Office 365 environments um, and also be able to bring a policy-driven approach to that. Um, so it streamlines your uh, IT delivery operations. And then finally, we made an announcement a couple of weeks back about our acquisition of a product called Unigma. And although this isn't specifically security related, this is about helping you be, to manage your cloud infrastructure and your, your public clouds, whether that's AWS or Azure or Google Cloud, being able to see the utilization, um, being able to manage that, also be able to get some visibility on how those platforms are running and where you can make some cost optimization from there as well. Uh, on top of that, outside of our uh, security management uh, suite, we've, we've got BMS, which is our professional services automation. So this is for things like your ticket, project management, accounting and things and it also has direct integrations with IT glue so for all your CMDB your document uh, and configuration management will be visible directly uh, inside and integrated with BMS and on top of that we've recently just launched the MSP insights which is really around uh, big data analysis uh, of um, you know your infrastructure and, and trends in the marketplace uh, next slide please
Perfect. <laughs> so where this actually fits in into securing your your, uh, your environment and um, uh, getting better control of it. So uh, partly, I guess, part of this presentation we're going to go through is going to talk about WannaCry. So a big chunk of that is is going to be having antivirus up to date. Um, also, making sure that you've got a contingency plan around your backups. But with that specific exploit, there was things around Windows patch management that needs to be taken into account and ensuring that your environments are up to date. If you look at the broader um, threat landscape, ensuring that not only your Windows but also your third-party applications are patched and up to date, as well as being able to automatically control uh, certain uh, certain threats and configurations inside your environment. And this is where the VSA comes into it. Um, part of WannaCry, uh, the exploit, it was um, specifically target, targeting SMB version 1.0. Um, and this is where the patch came into it as well. But this is also where Kaseya can come in and help not only from a patching point of view, but being able to identify where that's enabled on the network and potentially uh, automating the configuration and the restriction of that. Um, uh, that particular exploit. On top of uh, WannaCry also used certain ports that it needed inside um, uh, to talk through back to the internet. So we can programmatically block these ports via our agent procedures, which is our scripting language, and we can consistently deploy that and understand and manage those configurations inside the VSA. Uh, we've also got Traversed here again. So this is um, the ability to uh, talk to both your guests as well as your hypervisors, understanding the traffic that's going across your network links and being able to identify issues um, uh, in advance inside your data center as well as, well as your wide area network. Um, I alluded a little bit earlier about Auth Anvil product. A lot of the breaches, well, 63% of the breaches uh, in 2016 were based on um, uh, passwords and user authentication. This is where a product like Auth Anvil with its two-factor authentication, so this is not only a username and a password, but uh, what we call a, a token that you would use to authenticate yourself into a system can actually help minimize the chance of those types of exploits. Uh, Office 365, again, gives you uh, your email inside the cloud, but it also removes some of the visibility of what's happening inside that infrastructure. So with a product like 365 Command, with their dashboards and integrations into uh, Office 365, you can have a central console to understand things like um, where your mail is actually being kept, who has access rights, whether emails being forwarded and things like that. Um, and you can get that visibility really quickly and easily um, inside the, the platform itself without any additional configuration or relying on PowerShell scripts or, or customized reporting and things. And then finally, when there is um, an exploit or there's a threat, you need to be able to identify that. And this is where BMS, our ticketing system, can help consolidate all that alerting into a centralized place. You can build out workflows, SLAs, and notifications and things like that as well. So this is how Kaseya can help um, address uh, any threats and, and emit any threats inside your environment. And uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions around that at the end of the uh, session. Awesome. Well, thanks for that, Craig. Um, so what we're going to do now is just I'm going to hand over presenter to Tyler, and he is going to take us through um, the WebRoot presentation. All right, everybody. I'm getting my screen up for everybody making sure they got it once I see it. Oh, there we go, it showed up. We're gonna go ahead and get started. So I really do appreciate everybody joining in. Um, we're gonna go ahead and get started and we'll move to my section here where attack vectors and top ransomware payloads. So I'm gonna talk about a lot of different ransomware variants out there, some of which you've heard a lot of. Um, you know, obviously WannaCry is out there as one of the newest ones, uh, but also some of the older ones that are still actually infecting people and the various different attack vectors that they're using because they're all different. They all come from different angles, different ways of exploiting uh, either with social engineering or just, uh, you know, what you've got going on uh, OS level on your computer. And um, so we'll go ahead and get started and start out with phishing. And so this is a special type of malicious URL I know we're all familiar with uh, is stealing credentials through fake login pages is old news, right? but it's still the most effective method of compromise. Like literally, um, it grows every year. In fact, we found um, that they've tried some new tactics to prevent 
uh, like analysis, and that's JavaScript prevents leaving a page, and plain text avoids HTML analysis. But it's it's so popular that we found that 92% chance of, of users annually of being presented with a zero-day phishing site. Now, what I mean by zero day is it came out that day. Maybe you're subject to it for only a few hours. In fact, in fact, um, the Australia, New Zealand region, you guys are at the target for most phishing attacks. When analyzing, if you've taken a look at our 2017 threat report, I don't know if you guys have or not, um, you guys, uh, your section of, of time zone and area, you know, as far as your distribution of all high-risk URLs, over 70% of yours uh, are, are phishing. And uh, we do believe that's because you guys have the first time zone. You hit the day the first time. Uh, a lot of these, uh, you know, phishing campaigns, when they're, they go on, they're not active that long. In fact, we found the average was actually less than 15 hours. Sometimes they're coded not even to be a certain amount of time. Some people say, you know, oh, they only work for 24 hours. Sometimes what they do is they actually program it to just gather a set number of credentials. So once they hit 50,000 or 100,000, then they shut off. And so that could only be, depending on how successful they are deploying it, maybe only an hour, maybe 15 minutes. Um, but you guys are at the forefront of all different new types of phishing attacks. Most of the time are going to start in the Australian and New Zealand region because you guys hit the day first. And they program it to trigger on a certain when the day hits midnight, and you guys are, are the first welcoming hour there. Um, so some interesting emails you're going to see. This one's pretty pretty common, um, you know, saying hey, post service. Yeah, go ahead. Tyler, so, sorry just to cut in. Um, your, um, there's just a few people have got your webinar um, panel up coming on the, the right of the screen. Are you able oh, to? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Let me uh, see okay. if I can hide that. Would that help? Yes, that's, that's much better. Thanks for doing that. I apologize. I, 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 it's supposed to be smart and hide itself, <laughs> I, I, what it's done before in previous presentations, but we fixed that now. Um, so initially, thanks for having me fix that. Uh, it comes to you as an email. This is from your postal service. They have it for, you know, Royal Mail. They have it for New Zealand Postal Service, Australian Postal Service. Everybody's got a postal service, so that's what they go after, spoofing. You've missed a package. And, uh, you know, no longer do they actually just have executable malicious attachments inside a zip, right? They know a lot of people are, are sketched around that and don't want to run that. So what they do is they just give you a Word document now. It, it seems harmless. Technically, it is harmless. You, you open up the Word document, and this is what you're presented with, telling you it's a protected document, and they want you to enable content. Now, the giant trick here is, is the enable content button. Once you click enable content, you are allowing them full, full control, essentially, to do what the instructions are. I pulled up a little snippet of code what a macro looks like, in case you guys are curious. And what you're essentially doing is you're allowing the Word uh, executable, uh, the Microsoft Suite uh, process, to download and run from the Internet a malicious payload. It saves it as CRSS.exe and documents, and then runs it silently in the background. Um, and I'm sure you guys have all heard about macros. I highly recommend just disabling them. Um, I, I know there are legitimate reasons in the workplace to use macros, but there are, in almost all cases, workarounds for those, and I highly recommend doing that and just disabling them completely from the trust center. That's where you can do that, because you will reduce a big attack vector um, that, that is, you know, this is, is posed to you. Uh, all ransomware will try many attack vectors, but you betcha macro is number one of the top. So malvertising, you guys haven't seen this. Um, it's essentially booby trap advertisements where you click on an advertisement just like that one right there. You think it'd be for Joseph Clothiers and you'd be directed to a site where you pick out some, you know, shirts and ties and some suits and uh, you're not. Instead, you're redirected to a malware landing page where malicious code attacks the system. And it's all because, you know, beforehand somebody was going through all these ad network sites, visiting these, these websites and finding some that are insecure, finding some that are exploitable in order to host malware, right? And once they do that, they then get it ready and sell it off to somebody who wants to host malware on it. And these guys that create these fake ad networks that submit booby-trapped ads, they will actually submit good ads. They will submit, like a, create a good ad network and submit good ads for about two weeks to a month or so, so they gain reputation and gain circulation, and then they make the switch. And those of you who are going to be getting the slide deck, um, I've also included a nice little uh, summary of exactly how that works. Uh, for you guys. Uh, so now we're going to move on Locky campaign through Facebook. Now I know you guys have heard of Locky. It was number one in 2016 and early 2017. 
Um, but they come in through they come in every attack vector they can. So I'll explain how this one works. It's definitely something to watch out for because it's it's worm like capability. Um, it's essentially one of your friends. Obviously, it's, it's hacked friends account is how this all starts. Is one of your friends sends you a message, right? And you see it right there on the far left. It shows up with a photo .svg, and SVG is a relatively new image format, and it's used today for saving vector images. Um, it's the reason why cyber criminals, you know, chose SVG is because it's XML based and allows dynamic content. Uh, so what that means is they can add JavaScript code in. And so once you click on that photo, you are literally just right then and there pulls up a this website that's claiming to be YouTube. Now, as I'm sure a few of us have, have noticed, this is not YouTube. Looking at the URL there, you will find uh, that, that if that's not the correct URL. Also, it wants to add an extension. It's telling you you need to add this extension to watch the video. And those of us who have used YouTube, know that there is no extension required to, to view uh, videos. Uh, also, some more red flags, if there aren't any already enough, is that there are there's no rating of this extension, and there's not even an icon for it. So it's a no-name, no-icon extension. Um, you would think not to install it. But the problem is, is you only need one person to fall for this. And I've got about 200 friends on Facebook, not too many, not too, not too little, but that means only half a percent of my friends need to fall for this. And I know for sure half, a half a percent of my friends would fall for this and click Add Extension just to see, hey, okay, why not, you know? What it will do once you add the extension, it'll take advantage of the fact that you're already logged into Facebook, right? And it will then secretly send that message to all of your friends. That is where the worm capability works one person falls for it, it then spreads to all their friends, okay? And then um, from there, not only just doing that, that's how it spreads, um, the extension itself is essentially Nemucon, which is like a malware downloader. And uh, it will download Locky or other encrypting ransomware, but we've seen Locky come in through this. Um, so encrypting ransomware will come down and encrypt your documents, basically because you clicked on an image in Facebook message and then click add extension and that's all you had to do and it, the rest of it was basically automated. So this is what Locky looks like as far as once you're infected, the background looks like, changes your background to th those instructions. But I brought up here an affiliate ID because the reason why Locky is so successful and encrypting ransomware in general, um, WannaCry being the exception of just using one attack vector, but um, is that they go for as many attack vectors as they possibly can. I mean, because not everyone's going to fall for a macro, right? Not everyone's going to fall for a phishing. Not everybody's going to fall for the malvertising, right? Uh, but you will catch different segments of people in all of them. So they, they run all of them. So what they do is they literally have an affiliate ID where they contract other people who specialize in, in doing exploit kits, malvertising, uh, people who do just phishing, people who do just macro payloads, you know, or other types of Windows script files, and uh, they attach an ID to it. So when they, the victim comes to pay the original Locky, you know, authors and gives them money, they, they know how they were infected because of the ID attached to them because um, they know that, that they, have, they have different payloads for different attack vectors, and it corresponds. So it's like a payment system where they, they sort of everybody shares the, the, the ransom money uh, based on how successful they were. And just showing you how successful they were. Now, the most victims per day at 90,000 in a day, that was number one, reigning champ of most infections until we reach Water Cry, which is in the next couple of slides. Uh, and I got a whole bunch of Water Cry. But even at only a, this is this is a really you know interesting to gather data on this when when you have almost a hundred thousand a day, we found that the payout rate was just under three percent. But even at three percent payout, they're making over a million dollars a day, uh, which is just in crazy how much money is able to be made here. Um, and then you move on to crisis. Now this one you guys probably have heard of because this started out in the Australia and New Zealand regions. Um, it was mainly attacking small businesses in Australia and New Zealand, and it was sort of isolated to your guys' region for about, I'd say, eight to nine months before it came everywhere. And then it was really successful because guessable RDP names are still a thing, I guess. Um, like, literally, they use a program just like this. They scan, you know, Telnet for RDP.
the installations and they just uh, they try default usernames and passwords uh, like the simplest stuff that people have some people have computers where it's not no one's there's no physical keyboard and mouse connected or monitor connected to it it's just you know power and ethernet and they only ever use it to remote in to do certain things and they believe that's secure and traditionally that that is true they were like well no one can possibly touch it except me who logs into it right and you would think you know i know for a fact i wasn't looking at anything or clicking on anything i use this computer just for this purpose there's no way i could be attacked and really that's not the case what they were doing is is like you said, like easy, easy logger in, easy password. Uh, one example we had was uh, there's a warehouse PC that was a, a label machine that was printing out shipping labels for NFL, which is American football, you know, very popular uh, over here in the States. Anyway, they, they couldn't ship. It was hit with ransomware. And um, they, they were hit with, with, with crisis because um, they were wondering you know, how did it get on no one was was we even using it the the username was warehouse the password was warehouse and so people really need to be changing uh, their their usernames and passwords to really not easy stuff or just you know remove off of you move off, move off of the uh, you know the the port systems that are easily scannable um, you know use the secure counterparts like HTTPS instead of HTTP FTTPS um, and so other things we've seen as well are forgetting the files and going after the whole drive. This one is a little more rare. It's straight from Russia, from Petya. Uh, the guy who makes it's called Janus. And um, so essentially what he does is, or this type of ransomware, it'll just blue screen the computer. As soon as you get it, it'll blue screen the computer and it'll restart. And it looks like it'll restart the check disk. Right? This looks like just a standard normal check disk that you would have when your computer you know, doesn't shut down correctly or, or has a problem and needs to check the, the disk errors, right? It's not. This is actually a loading bar of him encrypting all your files. So this is all coded by him I'm just showing off his bootloader low-level structures on the disk um, where he's encrypting the master file table, just maybe basically every sector on the hard drive. So that way, once it's done, you know that, that loading bar or whatever it'll restart to just this and not even boot into Windows so your whole, whole hard drives locked the whole computer is useless until you uh, pay money on another computer to get the password to unlock it this was made famous by San Francisco underground okay um, where they were hit with basically the exact same thing I'm talking about and um, in this scenario they, they were hit on the weekend they had to just give everybody free tickets free tickets in the metro for a whole weekend and that's actually Honestly, pretty good. The whole weekend is is the only time you're down. They were able to get, you know, they had good backup solutions. StorageCraft would, you know, this is where, you know, uh, having good backup policies and prevention measures in place really does um, shine because if you can get back up and running in the small amount of time possible, then, uh, you know, you reduce how much, how much time you're bleeding money because uh, in some cases we have heard that people have basically no backup whatsoever. And, uh, and in those cases... Um, you know, it can be catastrophic, you know, beyond just the some crucial data, but maybe uh, absolutely essential data that you can't lose. And in some cases we've seen too, if the cyber criminals know that what, what you have is, is absolutely crucial, like if you let them know that and tell them, hey, look, I need this, it's absolutely essential, I wouldn't recommend that because what they'll do is they'll, they'll, they'll come around and ask for even more money. That's rare again, but I have heard that uh, multiple times. So it's definitely something to watch out for. So... Bitcoins in the underground ecosystem. Uh, I'm sure you guys have all heard Bitcoin just going insane right now. It's like $2,300 right now, um, but it's just climbing and climbing and climbing in price. Just to give you guys a, a rough estimate, about one year ago to the to the day, it was worth about $470. Bucks. Um, so it's it's quite a lot of money here. Uh, but it's not just because of you know cyber criminals going crazy with ransomware that's not why it's growing it's growing because it's so effective at being anonymous uh, and secure of a transaction that can't be hacked or traced right that everybody else wants to use it banks are seeing its potential and they're, they're going into it but uh, sorry I want to delve into you know the, the underground ecosystem like it's it's not just one person like these these lucky guys that are making this much money it's not just a group of guys or one guy it's an entire community of people like I said earlier, you have one guy or a group of guys that's just working on the payload, so just the actual executable that's doing the encryption, right, and sending your, your AES keys over to a secure 
command and control server, that's one group of people. But as far as how you were initially infected, maybe some botnet doing a phishing campaign, that's another group of people that the payload guys paid. Um, or exploit kit people who their job is solely just to browse websites and find find one that's selling something that's maybe uh, you know used by an ad network that's not secure at all. So they can exploit it, host malware on it, and then use it as a booby trapped ad. So there are, are different sections of people that facilitate you know this entire structure of underground cybercrime, if you will. And some of these guys technically don't even break the law. They just do one little piece of help in breaking the law, but that, that one little piece by itself isn't technically illegal, but they make millions a month. So it's uh, it's not going away, and the price of these cryptocurrencies is only growing, so it's, it's only going to get probably cost more and more money for these ransoms. I mean, gone are the days where you'd be able to pay $300, $400. I mean, now that they, they want thousands thousands of dollars for your data back. All right, so now we're going to stop on one encryptor. I'm sure a lot of you have been eager to find out any information you can from security companies about this, so I'm going to do a little deep dive for you. Nothing like as far as reverse engineering and code. Well, we do have that on the blog and other uh, presentations I'll give, but I'll be given just a, a brief overview and, and tons of information about it. So this literally is the most successful ransomware ever. Uh, I know I talked about Locky a lot. Maybe you've seen my previous presentations talking about Locky being the best ever. Well, it was beat. It was beat. Um, everybody was essentially beat because this this hit like 125,000 people or so in like a day. Uh, but it, what made it stand out is how it did it, right? It's despite what you may have read of other people saying it started as a phishing email, it did not. Uh, there has been no source email phishing found. Even IBM try to trace their supercomputers searching all their billions and billions of phishing and other honeypots for trying to find any link to this and they couldn't uh, because it was the, all they had to do is somebody just run this SMB and that's it it spreads from there so that's what it was there is a uh, it's you know SMB exploits essentially a file sharing vulnerability in Windows right Microsoft patched this vulnerability uh, dating back the start of, of their patching was fall of 2016 uh, Microsoft was already warning users to disable SMB1. Uh, they do have a blog on that, uh, I believe September, mid-September of last year, but no one took note, and no one really does until stuff like this happens, um, you know, because we've witnessed many people did not install the patch. So record-breaking, um, you know, over 100,000 machines, about 113,000 in just 24 hours, over 80 different countries. That's the really big part. Usually with these phishing campaigns, certain servers are going to certain locations, right, um, or certain IP ranges, which ultimately by geographic, uh, you know, uh, IP uh, assignment does sort of group a lot of different phishing campaigns to different regions. But since you can see this is just worldwide everywhere, um, it was definitely wormed through uh, exploits uh, at the SMB level, which is, as you can see, used by Windows <laughs> operating systems all around the world. And uh, many of these machines that were infected technically were not connected to, like, the Internet, as in, you're probably wondering, how does that happen? Well, no, they were connected to an internal network where other computers were connected to the Internet. But because this worm came through SMB to those computers that were connected to the Internet, those computers locally that were on the network that maybe didn't have Internet but did have communication, uh, SMB communication with another computer that did, it, it compromised all of those machines. So we're talking like tons and tons of people and organizations. I mean, I'm sure you guys have all seen this, um, you know, that it was uh, 61 NHS organizations disrupted. They had to turn away patients. Um, it's because, you know, when I was talking specifically about those machines that aren't connected to the Internet but are connected to a local Internet, we're talking machines like MRIs, lasers, X-rays, blood test machines, all this stuff were basically rendered like inoperable. And, uh, you know, 90% of hospitals also run still XP. I don't know why that is, if it's budgets or what's going on, but XP basically is no longer supported. It hasn't been supported since 2014. Uh, Microsoft did actually release the emergency patch for them um, just because they, they care so much. But, you know, uh, also rental factories had to shut down. Telecoms and gas stations in Spain were hit, and employees were basically just told turn off computers and just go home. Um, and you have to realize, too, the, the extent of this. This one exploit 
that was disclosed by Shadow Brokers. Um, it was just it was just one exploit from the dump, and there's a whole bunch more here. When we look, how many have yet to be even used? So we may see those. And the Shadow Brokers guys themselves even uh, are promising more exploits soon. In fact, they call it um, like their their fine wine club or wine and dine club, where they want twenty thousand dollars in Zcash, which is just another. It's an altcoin. It's just like Bitcoin, but it's another one that's growing. They feel will grow more than Bitcoin, but they want twenty thousand dollars in Zcash, and you could be like a subscription service where they will feed you more backdoors and exploits. Um, that essentially are known about um, by these hackers that NSA have been using as backdoors in everybody's computers, but aren't disclosed yet. So just more more stuff that could be used in the future. In fact, um, on that note, as we come to these closing slides, um, definitely patch your systems. I know we talked about, um, you know, oh sorry, how can I pick myself? That's the next slide. Uh, we have strong detection rules and have been catching all variants of WannaCry since it came out on that Friday. We saw it like 8.30 UTC. We, we determined it like shortly after. And uh, every new variant coming out has been caught in real time before uh, any chance uh, at execution. Uh, we still recommend you patch your systems with the Microsoft 17-010. Uh, like I said, emergency patches were released. It's recommended to block inbound traffic on port 445. Um, however, those of you who, who you know do accidentally definitely need it open, I know there are lots of other applications that use those ports, and if you're using those, then just definitely disable SMB1. Uh, so this is a slide I was talking about a little bit earlier. Heartbleed still vulnerable, and this is huge because I know everybody talked about it about you know two and a half years ago when it was a huge deal, but it, this is this is as of t t today. This is this many Amazon, Verizon, you know. Comcast, they're all running thousands and thousands of uh, services that are still vulnerable to to Heartbleed and in the future, um, you know, could be abused and stuff like this happens just because people aren't patching already known problems. Um, so that's my presentation. Uh, I really appreciate um, everybody joining it. Uh, while this does, this slide does say questions, it does have my email, feel free to jot it down. I, we are going to answer questions at the very end of the presentation. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, give presenter back over here to Carl. And I appreciate everybody Thanks joining. For Thanks for that, Tyler. That was a very great insight. I think one of the uh, things you mentioned there that just three percent of payouts are actually um, paid, and that that returns on one million dollars per day. I mean, that's a that's a pretty incredible business model they've got. Yeah, they have the uh, the the motivation to keep doing it. I sure do. All right, so from a storage craft perspective, um, let's take a look at, you know, what's the problem we're trying to solve? Obviously, um, it's, it's, uh, Tyler's done a very fantastic job at highlighting some of those concerns. But, um, you know, why business continuity planning is so critical to businesses. Now, when we think of disasters, we typically think of the disasters um, in the evening news, such as floods, tornadoes, hurricanes, and earthquakes. And these are um, terrible for anyone to endure. But as you can see here, statistically, it's only, it's only actually affecting 20% of users. And as actual fact, the, the natural disasters are just 3% of that, that orange part of the graph. So the, there's a far larger chance of something, you know, 80% of application based operation errors, that's where ransomware would fit into that scenario. And in this type of situation is where you need rapid system recovery. We need to be able to rapidly recover on site, um, you know, and, and, that, and that smaller chance of something naturally or physically going wrong, that's when we would want that off-site disaster recovery. And you know, if you think of a machine getting crypto or ransomware or some sort of problem that happens, you know, it might just be isolated or it might be across a number of machines, but we don't want to fail those ones off into the cloud or off-site. We want to rapidly recover them back on-site, um, you know, as, as the first point of the call. So, um, you know, interesting, some study that actually came um, consolidated from Gartner, IDC, and Forrester, uh, and this, this was largely across North America, but they're saying that 85% of critical systems are not backed up at all. Now, um, hopefully down here in Australia, New Zealand, we're, we're probably doing a lot better than that, I would assume, um, at backup, but they're saying that 80% of the loss is due to operational human errors application failures. So again, that's where that um, these ransomware or malicious activities would fit into that. 20% uh, down to hardware, operating system, power natural disasters, as we just talked about. But the other challenge is that data growth rates are doubling every two years now versus every four years. So the challenge here is 
one is the extra storage that we've got to deal with with backing this stuff up, but also the, the time it takes to back the data up. So we need an intelligent solution that can actually deal with this. I think the most alarming one at the bottom here is 17 to 40% of backup restores fail. So if you actually look at the top there, they're saying 85% of systems are not backed up at all. So that means that you know the rest of them, the 15% that are, or well, nearly half of them, the backups don't even work. So a key challenge for people is, is you know automating or knowing that they can deal with this situation. So this key messaging here is, are you ransomware ready? And 4% of organizations say that they're very confident of the ability to protect themselves, but that leaves a large number that aren't so confident. And obviously, uh, WebRoot have got a fantastic um, product available to help with this protection, but we need to consider um, more than just your antivirus or your, your malware type scenarios. So business continuity warnings, and I think the key thing with this one is it's a not, a, not a question of if but when. These things are going to happen, the, the people that are doing these types of things are making a huge amount of money and it's, it can come down to, to a user doing something silly and, and bringing that into the organisation. So we need to be aware of this. Um, you know, Homeland Security last year announced a ransomware um, variance um, alert on their site. I mean, this is pretty huge for someone like this to come and announce an issue. We're seeing stuff in the local news. Um, you know, Sydney Morning Herald malware attacks, Locky ransomware scams in Australia Post, um, crypto locker virus, Australians forced to pay. I mean, this stuff's real. You can buy insurance from AIG to protect yourself directly against this stuff. Um, it's pretty frightening. We've got stuff in the register about crypto zepto. You know, this this one I think Tyler brought up. The the, the encryption's so good that they actually give you incredibly easy to follow instruction on how to pay them. You know, if, if everyone's uh, user guides and stuff were this easy to follow, I think we'd all be doing really well. But they even give you a wiki link here to show you how easy it is uh, or how um, strong their encryption is. So it's pretty incredible. Um, you know, Sydney Morning Herald, this one's just the other week, that NASA ransomware attack. And again, a lot of that was um, down to, to older systems that, that, that had such a widespread impact. But the key thing is this stuff's real. Um, you know, 40% of businesses across North America experienced, experienced a malware attack um, last year, and more than a third of them experienced financial loss from resulting in business interruption. 20% of the target companies seized operations because of the, the damage they suffered, and more than 80% of the organizations that were breached, um, and this was an average size of over 5,000 employees on this, but they had high value um, data held for ransom. So this is, you know, incredible impact that it's having to businesses. And the key thing is that it, you, businesses need to be aware and be proactive about this. So it's about having that discussion with the businesses and saying, look, what would downtime actually cost us? And you know, if you let's say you've got a typical scenario, so let's say you had 100 staff and something went wrong at five o'clock in the day, that's eight hours times 100 people, 800 hours potentially of lost data if, if we had to roll back to last night's backup. So a key thing is, is looking at what you have today and putting a cost on the downtime. How long will it take to recover that system and re-enter the data? During that time that we were down and dealing with this, what happened to our customers? Did they now have to call someone else for support um, or to buy a product? Are they even going to come back to us? And then that's a customer lifetime value. And it's about changing that conversation to say, I can't afford not to do something about it rather than saying I can't afford to do that yet. So it's you know it's, it's about being smarter and having these proactive discussions because this scenario is very real. So in terms of the solution, um, StorageCraft is a very comprehensive recovery solution um, across you know on-prem um, and cloud applications. So what we want to look at first is just talking a little bit about best practice and then we'll jump in and just take a quick look at where the bits and pieces might fit in. So obviously step one is educate your employees. You have, the people have to know the basics in terms of what can go wrong. We need to make sure that people understand clicking on links that they don't know what they do, downloading software that they don't know what it is. These types of things, they need to understand that and you need to have this sort of discussion or training with the users to understand and prevent these types of risks. Second step is actions for your IT department or service provider. And these are things like patching, so obviously operating system software and, and things like so these RMM providers can help automate this process and manage this for us. You know, your antivirus, anti-malware solutions obviously need to be online and getting these updates. Um, you know, Tyler talked about the macro scripts, software restrictions and controls to lock these things down, and users shouldn't have administrative rights. So these are just basic things, but this all becomes part of a preventative measure. Um, again, patching endpoint device operating systems, configuring access controls, 
virtualized environments. I think we've got a huge uptake in ANZ across this. But there's some really key things here. So these slides are very useful to review and, and discuss with your businesses. Step three, this is where storage craft really comes in. Put a disaster recovery plan in place. And in spite of all the preventative measures, you need to have that possibility that you'll get hit. And you know, we always say this, a disaster recovery plan is the last line of defense. It's, you know, it's the last thing. We don't want to have to go back, but we also don't want to be paying someone else to unlock our data, and we need to be able to deal with this in a timely manner. So some of the key things should include off-site replication. Now this, this is actually becoming more and more relevant. And, and obviously if we go back to the statistics I looked at, well, only 3% chance that you're going to have a natural type of disaster. So there's far higher risk of a lot of other things happening requiring on-site recovery. However, off-site replication is doing more than just giving you off-site DR. It's going to protect your backup images. You know, your backups, as Tyler mentioned, could get infected over SMB connection. So all of a sudden, if we haven't secured our backups on site and they're infected, then we've lost everything. So we want an automated off-site replication so that if something did happen with my backups, I can pull them back and still recover. So we want to automate that process. We don't want to be backing up to tape and relying on someone to do it. We can't monitor that. So, you know, again, using RMM providers like this, uh, we can monitor replication and ensure that this stuff's getting off site, um, you know, particularly with our partners that are selling backup as a service or DR as a service. It's, a, it's able to put an SLA on this and know what your customers are doing. Uh, number three, keeping testing. Again, um, there's a high percentage of people saying that they can't recover from backups. You need to test your backups. And this comes in a lot of different means. So, you know, it's one thing to know that your backups actually work, right? If we can't recover the backups, then the whole thing's just a waste of time. So we need to know that you can test. But also from um, an IT uh, engineering perspective, you know, a lot of IT providers have staff that come and go or, or even, just, even just IT employees um, for a business. We need to know that that people that the people that are that are working at the time of an event know what to do. So going through a testing or um, scenario of actually recovering servers is is not only to ensure that the backups work, but it's understanding the process um, and what's required to actually achieve that and everything's in the right place. So testing, um, you know, really important. And Storagecraft have an automated um, virtualization platform which can test the backups regularly to make sure that they're booting up. And that's obviously ensuring that the systems can, can boot them up and all the bits that are in place. So that's key. And then obviously this wraps into recovery is, again, it's, it's not about backup anymore. It's about having disaster recovery options in place. Can we rapidly virtualize backup? from just a few moments ago. Um, you know, can we recover in the cloud or something else if, if all else fails? So that's a key um, thing to consider. Now, StorageCraft is the most comprehensive and reliable disaster recovery solution because it includes your backup, centralized management, off-site replication, and obviously the pivoting point there is recovery. Again, the, the most comprehensive thing is knowing that we can recover whatever we have or wherever we need to go across virtual, physical, Windows, Linux, or in the cloud. Now, the, the key thing, I guess, is, is there's been a huge amount of cloud adoption. People are moving into the likes of SaaS applications, such as Office 365 or G Suite, Salesforce, Box, these kinds of things. And what you're eliminating is that initial risk you might have had on site, such as high availability, um, geographical redundancy, resiliency with that data. But what's still there is this huge percentage of risk with malicious activity, security breaches, people deleting stuff because they're leaving the business. If we think of Office 365, you delete some stuff, you've got your 30 days retention, it's very easy to, to recover that. But then outside of that, the data's gone for good. You know, if, if, if this, this kind of scenario is encouraging people with bring your own devices, they're now working remotely or from home, they're more prone to click on links and things outside of work. And that's where your business data can come at risk. So having a solution that can back up these applications and give you rapid granular recovery is becoming more and more critical and, and you know, really identifying a big weakness or forgotten um, protection. You know, when it was on site, we were backing those exchange servers up. All of a sudden, it's in the cloud and, and people are making assumptions that, that there's backup there and it's not always the case. So in terms of storage craft, where bits and pieces fit in here, if we look on-prem on the left there, we've got physical servers, tablets, left, um, laptops, desktops, virtual environments. So the Shadow Protect software can back these up as frequent as every 15 minutes to some on-site storage. 
in the sort of BDR environment that gives us a, a backup and disaster recovery server to, to rapidly recover these backups, or into larger environments we could leverage your existing hypervisors to rapidly recover back into. We've got intelligent FTP replication off-site to our managed service providers. We're just about to introduce public cloud um, replication for longer-term cheap archival of your data. There's an S3 connector coming out um, by the end of the week. And then we've got storage craft cloud services. We you could also choose to send your backups for rapid disaster recovery. And for RRP is 88 bucks a month. That gives you a server in the storage craft cloud. And for no cost, you can log into a portal and instantly virtualize your whole server and network environment. And it's end to end, so we help you revert that back on site. So you know it's not expensive, but it's giving you disaster recovery in the cloud. At the top of the middle there, we're talking about storage craft, cloud backup and recovery. So this is file backup for those, you know, those laptop sort of people that are moving around all the time. This enables us to capture critical files and immediately um, back them up in the cloud. Then over the top right is storage craft, cloud backup. So currently supporting Office 365 and G Suite. The ability to back these up frequently throughout the day. Um, so every eight hours is the current uh, frequency of that with a portal that you can instantly search and recover your files from. So just some key things to wrap up here. Back up frequently throughout the day. We can't afford to back up once a day anymore because it can result in a huge amount of data loss, particularly the larger the organization, the more people that are working. You know, it's changing that mindset from we can't afford not to have a proper solution in place. And we need to protect your backups and replicate a copy of site. We need to isolate that data and make sure we do have a proper last line of defense. Finally, ensuring you can recover quickly. So again, having tools in place to ensure you can rapidly recover systems. And again, StorageCraft um, software includes disaster recovery, such as a virtual boot to instantly virtualize your backups, or Head Start Resort to pre-stage your backups into a standby environment. Finally, test your backups regularly. You need to know that this works, so in the event of something going wrong, you're comfortable, you know the process you need to do, and you know that those backups can be recovered. So everyone, thank you for attending the webinar today. Um, hopefully some of you may have put in some questions along the way. Otherwise, um, we'll spend a couple of minutes now just giving you time to ask Tyler, uh, Craig, or myself any questions, um, and we're happy to, to talk through them. All right. Okay, guys, nothing's come through just yet, so we'll just give you um, a, a minute or so. But um, yeah, otherwise, thanks for coming along to the webinar today. Okay, so we just had a question from Luke um, asking for customers with poor DSL connections, what would you recommend for that? So I'm assuming you are talking about um, backup, Luke, in that scenario. Um, the key thing there is the Shadow Protect backups are at a sector level and leveraging continuous incremental backups means it just does one full backup at the start and then incrementals forever. So that approach, um, you know, particularly if it's a smaller branch type uh, site, is very easy to manually seed that initial backup to the remote site and then just send the incremental images going forward. And we've got over 2,000 customers doing that across Australia and New Zealand with you know, really poor DSL type connections. So if you, if you want to talk about that scenario, please do reach out to, um, to the, the StorageCraft sales team and we can talk you through what's um, involved there. Now another question from Jim, using StorageCraft to back up via network share, is it secure enough to be protected by a ransomware attack? So that's a really good question. The key thing there, and I'm just going to touch on these quickly, guys, for time. The key thing there is you need to secure the, the network share where that data is and even that machine itself. So some of our partners would go as far as have a backup server that's not on the domain, um, and the share, more importantly, is locked down to only a user that the Shadow Protect software is backing up to. You don't want to have an open share that the ransomware could easily access, and you definitely don't want to be mapping network drives to those shares. So we've got a good uh, comprehensive guide on securing your backups and your site from ransomware, but obviously that, that's your first sort of step, and the second process is to make sure you're replicating a copy off-site. Our image manager software that does the replication will verify the backups before sending them, uh, and that way we know that that, that remote site isn't likely to uh, get infected. I'm um, just so moving on. Peter, can we get a copy of this webinar? Yes, we'll be sending it out to everyone that's um, uh, registered for this webinar. Um, Oliver, uh, Olivia, sorry, um, yes, same same question there as well. Uh, Matt asked, what is available from StorageCraft for BMR to cloud services? So um, 
Storagecraft, what happens is you send a copy of backups to Storagecraft Cloud, you can instantly virtualize them our cloud. At any time you can request a BMR drive where you can download or we ship you back the data on a disk. Bear in mind you're still running in our cloud. It pre-stages the restore back on site and then it does a final sync with the running VM in our cloud and reverts you back onto bare metal or into a virtual environment. So it's a full end-to-end -end solution. 88 bucks a month is all you need to pay. So it's a really um, great solution. Again, sales at storagecraft.co.nz. Feel free to reach out to the team for a demo. Um, someone's asked um, cloud slash AWS Azure. I'm not sure. Oh, you're talking about backing up. Yeah, so, so Storagecraft have got their own cloud service. Um, we are just about to launch an option to replicate your backups into AWS. Initially, that's going to be for long-term archival, where you would download the backups out of, but that'll eventuate into a full migration offering um, in the future as well. Um, someone's just asked, um, sorry, yes, these are, look mostly about Storagecraft questions, so I'll, I'll just try and cover these off quickly. Um, Tristan's asked, could you please distribute a copy of the guide securing the image location? Yeah, sure. Um, we can send that directly out to you, Tristan, or just reach out to the team. Um, but yeah, it's um, it's a key thing there to, to really understand or make sure the team are putting in place, you know, processes to secure those backups. So it's not, it, it's any backup product, you know, they're, they're, those backups are on site, they're at a risk of getting infected and, and we need, um, you know, we need to make sure that, that that's locked down. It's a really critical part of the piece. Um, there are no so Matt's just asking about public cloud again. So yeah, we're, we're we've got options there, Matt. If you want to reach out to me, I can talk to you more about that in detail. Um, Peter's asking um, IFTP sending to remote FTP servers that secure. So yes, with Storagecraft, with any replication solution, when you send your backups, it will verify them first. If the, it does an MD5 check. If that file has been infected, it will not send it to the remote site. So yes, um, all of the replication solutions built into our technology um, are secured by that. Um, got another question from Mark about pros and cons in cloud in terms of what it protects and and if it's still vulnerable. Um, let's um, catch up separately, Mark, on that one. I'm just not can't sort of clarify that whole question, um, but but we can cover that off with you. Um, someone else, Brian's asked a link for securing backups. So, um, Brian, we um, uh, well, I have a copy of these questions. So, the people that have asked for that, um, we can send it to you directly. I'm not sure if we've got it published online. We probably should do. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll come back to those people that have asked for that. Um, Tyler, I've got a question for you here from I Peter. See the wanna cry? How many infections yeah. in Australia? Uh, unfortunately, we, we don't have uh, like concrete numbers of the actual, you know, uh, damage count of, of everything and everybody infected. Um, as far as what we can see is is the sensory nodes that we have, which means the installations we have. Um, but it, it did seem to attack primarily um, Russia and um, like Eastern Europe. Um, and that's mainly because of when it first started, the time zones. Uh, Australia was, was, was lucky you guys were on that, that holiday. Um, it's it's not Aztec Day. It sounds like it though. What's it called? Uh, I forget which day you guys had off. But anyway, you you guys had that day off. Um, literally, yes, yeah, <laughs> Aztec Day. Okay, uh, you had that day off, so a lot of people really weren't hit um, with it in in, in Australia. Um, there wasn't many people really looking out for it. We were prepared to to start hearing with each different time zone going to see damage control, and Australia was one of the least affected. Just so you guys know. But unfortunately, we don't we don't have you know exact numbers on how many of that were hit. Cool. Um, one there from Eric. What's your breach history for Office 365 um, cloud backup services? So from a backup perspective, Eric, um, the Storagecraft cloud backup product will um, back up every eight hours, and it keeps the retention forever, and it's unlimited storage. So you'll be able to search and go back to any point in time. Um, you know, in terms of recovering files. So, yeah, from a backup perspective, um, you, you've got um, all your snapshots. But in terms of breach history, I'm not sure on that one. Tyler, do you know what he might be referring to there? The breach history on 365? Um, I, I haven't seen any, any notable ones as, as far as that. But, I mean, that I'm not trying to say, hey, look, they're secure or anything. It sounds... In my nature and my business I work with, it doesn't feel like anything secure. Um, but uh, no, I have not seen any um, 
uh, or heard of any noticeable breach in Office 365. Cool, no worries. I might have misread that question, but um, yeah, uh, Eric, just reach out to us directly um, if, if you want to know something more there. All right, guys, there's a few people asking for a copy of that document, um, so we'll send that out. Um, actually, just another one's come up from Peter. Um, the WannaCry inspections, how quick did WebRoot respond and stop encryption of files on the endpoints? So, yeah, eight. I think it was like 8.20 UTC is when we first saw it. We stopped it shortly th thereafter, and we were catching everybody. Um, all, all new variants being sent out. I know there were a lot of, you know, the kill switches being sent out, but basically we stopped, uh, like, uh, uh, hundreds uh, of new different variants that were coming out we caught in real time. So new, never before seen iterations of the WannaCry we were catching in real time before they stopped. Uh, 8, 820 uh, UTC, if you want an exact time, um, that's when we first started seeing it. Uh, and then as soon as our researchers saw it, we determined it. Awesome. Okay, cool. A um, couple more coming through um, about that document. Sorry, I should have actually had that prepared and attached it to the webinar for everyone, so I apologize, um, but we will make sure that's sent out to everyone. All right, guys, well, I think that's all the questions. So, um, Craig, did you want to add any final words to, um, to, to wrap up this webinar? Uh, no, I think it, yeah, I think it's all good. I mean, you, thanks very much for the presentation. So uh, they were um, excellent. Uh, hopefully, if you've got any interest in any other parts of the Gasab portfolio and how they can integrate with your current solutions, we'd be more than happy to discuss further. And looking forward to doing another one of these in the near future. Awesome, great. All right, thanks for that, Tyler. Did you want to add anything here? I think actually there's just one last question there. If you maybe want to um, cover that off, and then we'll finish up. Um, I, I, I'm not a marketing or sales person, but the question was um, WebRoot DNS is the same as uh, OpenDNS. Um, I do believe uh, that's that's what it is geared towards. Uh, I can get you uh, like a sales engineer who, who would know exactly what they're talking about, but I, I do believe it's a uh, sort of our competition in, in, in line with that, if that's what you guys are calling it. I think we call it uh, secure DNS is what we call it or something like that um, but but yes it's it's basically our version of that once again I'm not a sales or marketing guy um, I'm sure they they have a different you know lingo and verbiage for it but I can get you all the information if you are interested for that um, uh, just shoot me an email uh, my, my email is tmoffit at webroot.com it, it was on display it should also be in the slide deck which I do believe has been mentioned that will be going out to everybody um, so you feel free to ask me any questions you have as well. Awesome. Great. Well, um, I think we've covered off all the questions there. So, uh, everyone, thanks again. Um, thanks, Tyler and Craig. And um, hopefully we can hear from everyone uh, in the future going forward with any other queries and how we can help you. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thanks very much. Bye, guys. See you, guys.